My name is Mike. I'm the lead pastor of uh, One Church Barfield, so the other campus, which does exist, so that's a good thing. Uh, we are one church, multiple locations. Uh, today we are one church in one location, and so we're glad that you're here. Um, and uh, for those of you joining online, welcome as well. Uh, last week, Steve talked, uh, he opened up the, the second chapter of James, and he talked about uh, really what this, this idea of faith looks like. So he talked uh, about the, the idea that faith looks like boldness. So you don't, have, you don't have faith that doesn't produce anything. Faith produces boldness. Specifically, last week, he talked about how faith produces a boldness in us not to show partiality. So there, there are a few things you need to, to know about partiality. One, well, it's one thing cut, <laughs> broken up into a couple different areas. So one, it, it always benefits us. So we don't show partiality because it doesn't benefit us. We show partiality because it does. And, and so sometimes it benefits us directly. Right, so you show partiality, and because of that partiality, you get money, or you get power, or you get fame. Partiality can, can benefit us in that way, but also sometimes it benefits us indirectly. When we show partiality or favoritism, we, sometimes we just feel more comfortable. Sometimes it's just more about how we feel than what we get. And yet... What James says, opening up chapter 2, is that real faith seeks the goodness of others. Real faith seeks the goodness of others. Do me a favor. Uh, we're going to pick up in James chapter 2. If you have your Bibles, open up to James chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 14. As you do that, I have a question for you. What is written above verse 14 in your Bibles? Go ahead. Shout it out. Faith and works, faith without works is dead, faith and deeds. Okay, so what you need to know about those headings is they're not original to the original manuscripts. Like James didn't go, this is a good spot to stop. Let me write this heading uh, so that everyone knows I'm transitioning from one thought to another. Sometimes those headings are helpful, right? Uh, they give us an idea of what the section is about, but sometimes they're not helpful. And I would, I would venture to say not only the headings, but chapters and verses sometimes are not helpful. When you're studying your Bible, you have to ask the question, do I need this heading here? Do I need to stop here? Or is the author continuing a previous thought? And in this circumstance, starting in verse 14, James is continuing a previous thought. And what, he, what, his, what his thought is, is he's continuing this thought where he's, he's teaching us what does real faith look like when it's expressed? What does real faith look like when it's expressed? Uh, some of you may know that I root for the best baseball team on the planet. You can boo, but you can't argue with it. We may have spent lots of money, but we, are, we have earned every player that is on our team that makes us the best team in the world. Now, the Braves may be the number two best team. I'll give you that. But there's a large gap. So we'll see this, this, this year. This is my first year uh, preaching to Braves fans. For the last six years, I preached to Giants fans. And Dodgers, see, you get it. The first service had no clue. Nobody watched baseball in the first service. They're like, Giants? Is that football? Uh, so so I, I've been existing in this place where every time I brought up the Dodgers, and it's been a lot, I've been booed for it. Like hundreds of people booing me at the same time. So I'm used to it. But, but I put on this hat. And it brings back memories for me. There, there's like sweat stains on it from those hot summer nights out at, the, out at Dodger Stadium, just taking in the Dodgers beating whatever team, uh, whatever team they're playing. <laughs> My wife and I, our first date was at a Dodgers-Rockies game, fireworks on the field afterwards. It, it, not us, it was actual fireworks. <laughs> 
But here's, I think we have something to learn from the, the sports community this morning. See, how weird would it be for me to put this hat on, throw on my Dodgers jersey and go down to a Dodgers Giants game? To have the Giants hit a home run, which never happens. And for me to stand up and cheer like crazy. Wait, wait, let me sec it for you. <laughs> How crazy would it be for you UT fans to go down to Neyland Field and, 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 and watch them play the Bulldogs? You can boo, it's okay. And you, you got your UT jersey on and you, and, and Georgia scores, which they do often. And, and, and you, you're just like, you know what, I want to be on the winning team. I'm going to stand and I'm going to cheer my guts off. Well, here's what happens at Dodger Stadium if you do that. If I wore this hat and I wore my jersey and I'm cheering for the Giants, I'm going to get shanked. <laughs> That's L.A. They don't mess around. This is not Nashville, this is not Knoxville, this is L.A. People have died for less walking out of a Dodger game. <laughs> if you go down to, to Athens and you're a Georgia fan, they're playing Alabama, can I get a roll tide? <laughs> I knew. This ser the last service they didn't have anybody, it was like one or two people. Um, if, you, <laughs> if you go down to Athens, and Alabama comes to town and you start cheering for the elephants? Is that? I don't even know. I don't. <laughs> you start cheering for Alabama. It's not going to go over well. You may not get shanked, but you're going to get a lot of weird looks. Why? Because it's inconsistent. I'm wearing a Dodger hat and a Dodger jersey. I'm rooting for the other team. You're wearing your UT gear, you're rooting for, for Georgia. You're wearing your Georgia gear, you're rooting for Alabama. It doesn't make any sense. And nobody in the sports world would do that. But it's different in the church. See, in the church, put on our Jesus hat and our Jesus jersey, but we love rooting for the other team. I would get shanked at Dodger Stadium for doing that. But in the church, we go, you know what, that's okay. As long as you root for the home team a little bit. As long as you come to the stadium. As long as you know the stats. See, we don't really care who you root for. Just, we just want you to look like you're rooting for Jesus. And, and if you do that, then, then we're good. And I think we, we have something to learn from the sports world. That it's not, it's not about just rooting a little bit for the home team. It's about being all in. And James is going to continue to show us that, I'm going to put this like this so you can look at it the whole time. <laughs> He's going to show us how untrue that is. He's going to show us. That in the kingdom of God, much like Dodger Stadium or Knoxville or Georgia, I'm sure it's the same in Alabama. When you put that jersey on, it means something. And it changes the team that you identify with. See, the problem is that most people who aren't believers, right? Most people who are walking around the streets, they have... Zero problem with Jesus. They're like, wait, Jesus wants to forgive me? Sign me up. They're like, Jesus is the comforter, the good physician? Yes, I need that in my life. People, people don't have a problem with Jesus. They have a problem with his church. And it's because they, they put on the Jesus uniform and they root for the other team. There's no sincerity in the church today. We lack the, this, this outward expression of what we say happened on the inside. 
And James, he's going to point out what a big problem this is for us. What a big problem it is for the church, but more so what it is, what a big problem it is for you, for me, for one of us. The, the, the person who's professing faith to not have anything expressed on the outside. Before we get there though, we have to understand what does life look like? If, if we're going to express this faith on the outside, what does life look like? Well, for that we're going to Matthew chapter 5. And I'm going to paraphrase because it's a long, uh, it's a long section of scripture. But uh, in Matthew chapter 5, it's the Sermon on the Mount. You may know uh, the Beatitudes, right? The, the, that's where we're, we're picking up today because what Jesus is going to do, he's going to preach this message. And he goes from place, this isn't one time where he preached this message. This was the message of Jesus. He took it every, he was like a, an evangelist, Billy Graham. Billy Graham didn't have 4,000 different sermons. He preached one and it worked. Jesus only preached a few. You may be aware, but the Sermon on the Plain looks a lot similar to the Sermon on the Mount than different. And so he would go from place to place preaching this one sermon. And it starts off with the Beatitudes. It looks like this. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. And I imagine being on that mount, overlooking the Sea of Galilee, hearing these words and going, what are you talking about, Jesus? That's not what the world says. The world doesn't say, blessed are the gentle. You got to go take the bull by the horns, am I right? Blessed are those who, who are insulted and persecuted. Blessed are those who who get things told about them that aren't true. Blessed are those who mourn. I'd be like, what are you talking about, Jesus? Because the kingdom of God is an upside down kingdom. The kingdom of God makes no sense if you're, if you're, standard for what is right and what is pure is the world that you live in. It makes no sense because Jesus comes and he turns it and flips it on its head and he says, no, this is the kingdom of God and you've been missing it. The kingdom of God is not the way of the world. And so James is going to continue to show the importance of the church being set apart, the church being different. Now, what you need to know is, we talked about this in the first week of the series. James is a pastor. He's a pastor of the church in Jerusalem. And because of persecution, he's had his, his congregation disperse. And so now he's asking the question, like, how do I still pastor them even though they're, they're not here every Saturday? Which Sunday now, but Saturday then. How, how, do, how do I pastor them? when I don't get to interact with them on a, on a daily basis. So he sends them this letter. And what James is doing is he's asking the question, what do I need my church to get? Like what, what do they need to know? And as we get into to verse 14, I think this is the answer. This is what he as a pastor needs his church to get. Because it's at the core of everything else that he's going to talk about. It's at the core of everything else in the Christian life. You have to understand what he's about to say. Verse 14. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? And so... He's got people in his congregation who believe that the knowledge that they have acquired is enough to save them. 
He has people who are teaching Sunday school. They're teaching Bible study classes. They, if, you, if you don't know the Jewish culture, it's amazing. By the time they're, they're bar mitzvahed, they, they know most of the Torah. They, they got it down. They can repeat it. I was there. It was amazing. But the question is, are they being transformed by it? And the culture lends to a, a church that's just focused on information. And James is going to go, look, head knowledge is not enough to save you. Now, we have to battle a little bit, right? Some of you who do have that head knowledge, you're like, that's not what Paul said. You're kind of right. Romans 3, 28. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Well, that's weird. It feels like a contradiction, doesn't it? I mean, on one hand, James is saying you have to have works to be saved. And Paul's saying you don't have to have works to be saved. What is the deal? Until you understand that Paul is talking about how you are saved. And James is talking about how you know you are saved. They're two different things. Paul, Paul's interested in justification. The moment in which we are made justified. Works have nothing to do with that. In fact, he's going to go on and say it's so that we can't boast. But James is interested in a different question, a question I want to ask today. How do you know you're saved? You look at your life. The things that you do between Sunday afternoon and Sunday morning, how do you know you're saved? In verse 15, he's going to Start by showing us evidence you're not saved. Ready? Here we go. Verse 15 and following. If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. So he says, those of you who just simply come up to someone in need and, and, and say, go in peace, be warmed and filled, which by the way was a Jewish blessing at the time, a very common thing for Jewish people to say to people in need. And he's calling them out. He's saying, all you're doing is, is providing them well wishes. But see, thousands of years later, we have our own saying. You know what that is? Bless your heart, I'll pray for you. Bless your heart, I'll pray for you. And here, here's what I'm saying. I, I've made it a point, and it doesn't always happen because sometimes I just am going from one place to another. I've got an appointment or something else like that. But whenever possible, when someone asks me for prayer, I stop right then and pray for them. And here's why, because if I don't, I know I'm going to go off to the next thing and I'm going to forget about it. And people cared enough to ask me to pray for them. So as long as I can, I stop right there and pray for them. Because I don't want to say go in peace and be, war be warmed and filled. In other words, James is saying, if you're default, not if you've ever done this one time. All of us in this room have done this one time. But if your default is when you could be that answer to prayer, all you're willing to do is pray. Then you might have to check your faith. See, sometimes we tell people we're going to pray for them when we have the means and the ability and the time to be the answer to their prayers. We just don't want to be bothered. And if that's your default, check your faith. Someone comes to you and says, hey, I really need a ride. And you just don't want to be inconvenienced, check your faith. Someone comes to you and says they really need a meal. And you know that it would take time out of your day. 
Check your faith. And James, as he continues, he's going to know that there are those people in his church who are going to listen to this message that, that faith without works is dead. And they're going to go, I don't think so. And so he starts asking questions in his mind. And he's going to answer those questions before they even ask it. He says, but, but someone, verse 18, someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. This word for show is not just ob an observation. It's not just, I want to observe your faith apart from your works. This is a, more of a, has more of a legal connotation. It's, a, it's evidence. I want to see the evidence of your faith apart from your works. In, in other words, prove to me you have faith. See, in the church, we think of faith as something that's internal, something that's inside of each of us. It, it, it's not something other people can experience. It's not something other people can see. And James says that's malarkey, part of my French. He says, show me. I want to see the evidence of your faith apart from your works. And the underlying current there is you can't. Go ahead and try. He says, but I, I'm going to show you my faith because of my works, by my works. You're going to see my faith in the way that I live it out, in the way that I express it. Go ahead and try, but I know you can't. But I can. James is going to, in verse 19, he's going to start, um, which I love. I mean, I'm a sarcastic guy. It's not good. It's terrible. Um, but I appreciate good sarcasm every now and then. He's going to get a little sarcastic. So if you, sarcasm is biblical. There you go. Um, <laughs> he says to his readers, he's like, you believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is use useless? And what he's saying is good doctrine. Look, we have people who all they care about is, is right doctrine. That's it. They, they want to know the right things. They want to believe the right things. They have no interest in doing the right things. And what James is saying is, your right doctrine is useless if it doesn't produce transformation inside of you. It's useless. It's not useless on its own. I'm not telling you to go out and listen to, to, to pastors with horrible theology. What I'm saying is that's not everything. It can't stop there. It has to produce transformation that comes out of you. And what he's saying is, Good doctrine is not enough to save you. In fact, he goes so far. Hey, you know those demons? Those demons that in Revelation are going to be thrown into the fiery pit? They've got right doctrine too. Mark chapter 3, verse 11. And whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. So they see Jesus, and right away they know who he is. They fear him, they fall down, they cry out, and they speak right doctrine. You are the son of God. And James is going, are they saved? The answer is no. And he's, he's going, look, they have right doctrine and it even affects how they live. But they're not saved. They're still de destined to, to the fiery pit of burning sulfur for all of eternity. Their actions don't line up with their doctrine. And then James is going to transition. So he's just made his opening statement. And now he's going to move into some illustrations. Verse 21 and following. 
Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And so he gives this illustration and he, he, he's talking about the, the time when Abraham took his son Isaac and, and they gathered all of this, um, this, this supplies that they needed for what God had asked him to do. And then they're going up the, up the hill and God says, says, Abraham, gather all the supplies and take your son Isaac and, and bring all the, the things that are needed to sacrifice him on the altar. And Abraham goes, wait, what? You mean this son that I've been praying for for, for literally a decade or a, a, a hundred years? You, you, you know, this son that I've put all my hopes and my dreams in? God's like, yep. And Abraham's like, I don't get it. I don't understand. God, you fulfilled the longing, the, the, the deepest desire inside of me. When you gave me Isaac and now you're just going to take him away? And God says, yep. He says, I know you don't understand, but do you trust me? I know this doesn't make any sense to you, but do you trust me? And so Abraham gathers all the stuff and he takes his son Isaac and Isaac's like, where are we going? He's like, we'll t I'll tell you when we get there. <laughs> and they climb up the mountain, the, the very place where the Temple Mount is today. He starts building this altar, and Isaac's helping him build the altar. And Abraham goes, okay, now get on the altar. And right away, Isaac's like, I know what that's about. He gets on the altar. And Abraham's ready. I'm, talk I'm talking knife raised, ready to, to offer up his son on the altar. And God goes, wait, 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 what are you doing? And he's like, I was just trusting you. And God goes, I know. Take him off there. And we get this illustration of Abraham's faith expressed through radical actions. I mean, his faith wasn't just internal. Anybody who knew what he was doing would go, that's crazy. And yet he did it. His faith on the outside... gives testimony to his faith on the inside. But James is not done. He's going to use another illustration. It's an illustration of Rahab. And in the same way, James, uh, verse 25, in the same way was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. First of all, how would you like to be Rahab? Like Abraham gets Abraham our father. She's forever known as Rahab the prostitute. Like, She's probably like, guys, it's been thousands of years. Like, can we, can we drop that? Like, can we drop that part of my name? I have a new life in Christ. Like, I'm saved. I'm forgiven. James still goes back to it because it shows the transforming power of God. That's who she was. It's not who she is. But he, he reminds us of the story of Rahab, the book of Joshua. And Rahab was a prostitute, in case you didn't know. And these spies come in as, as the Israelites are getting ready to take the promised land. They send spies in and, and they get in past the, the walls and her, her apartment was on the walls of, this, of the city. And so they, they climb in to her apartment and she has heard, she's heard incredible stories of this God of the Old Testament. I mean, his armies have been winning wars that they have no business winning. One after another, they're outmanned and outgunned, and she's heard, and so she, she knows he's, tr he's the true God. And so his people come in through the window, and she hides them at great risk to herself. I mean, if, if, the, if 
her country, her people found out what she was doing, she would have died, her and her family. But she was willing to risk because of her faith. She was willing to risk because God had changed something in her. See, the faith of Abraham and Rahab was shown by their actions. And like them, our faith is also shown by our actions. It's never not shown by our actions. The double negative, so there you go. It's never not shown by our actions. If we have faith in something, it's always shown by our actions. Let me prove it to you. This morning, how many of you put on a belt? Thank you on behalf of everyone else for holding up your pants. <laughs> but here's what it looked like. You knew in your mind, you had faith that that belt was going to hold up your pants. So what did you do? You put the belt on. If you didn't think the belt was going to hold up your pants, you wouldn't have put it on. Then, then you were like, well, I got to get to church. And so I have faith that my car is going to get me to church. So I'm going to then get into my car and drive it to church. And then on the way, on the way to church, you... You had faith, maybe it was justified, maybe not. I don't know who's out driving in Murfreesboro today. But you had faith in other drivers that they wouldn't kill you on your way here. So you kept driving. And then you got here and you walked into the building and you had faith that the chairs you're sitting on would hold your weight. You know how I know that? I'm the only one standing. <laughs> our faith is always put on display by our action. Always. If you didn't believe that the chair you're sitting in would hold you, you'd be standing in the back. True faith can't be separated from the works of that faith. It's impossible. If you said that you had faith in a belt but wouldn't put it on, that means you don't actually have faith in that belt. And so James proves his point. And he, in, uh, in verse 26, he's going to drive it home one more time. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead so also faith apart from works is dead. So he uses an argument that we can't argue with. Like if you're a body and your spirit leaves, what are you? Dead. dead. There's only a few of you. Some of you aren't sure. Um, <laughs> if you are a body and you don't have a spirit, you're in the ground. Like if you're a body and your, your spirit has left, you're not alive. At least the body is not. And he says, just like that, faith apart from works is dead. And he says that if the body and spirit are separated, we're dead. Without works, your faith is dead. And I feel like the takeaway from this passage is pretty obvious. But I want to dive in a little bit and I want to see what God might have for us today. Here's the takeaway. Saving faith produces radical action for the upside-down kingdom of God. Saving faith produces radical action for the upside-down kingdom of God. Here, here's what I mean. I found this on the internet, and it made me laugh because, one, I just hate social media. Like, I think it's, I think it's an, a necessary evil for pastors, mostly because y'all are on it. So thanks for ruining my life. Uh, <laughs> but this will ring true for you. If it looks like a duck, walks like a duck, and quacks like a duck, according to Facebook fact checkers, it is in fact a squirrel. <laughs> but here's what I know. If it looks like a duck, and if it walks like a duck, and if it quacks like a duck, it's what? A squirrel, good. <laughs> Tracking. <laughs> it 
If you want to be a Christian, you look like a Christian, you walk like a Christian, and you talk like a Christian. Abraham took his son and he put him on the altar, raised the knife, ready to do what God asked him to do. Put his faith on display. Rahab. She hid those spies at great risk to her own life because she trusted in God. Can you see how much she risked? <clears throat> James doesn't use small examples. James doesn't use little things to support faith. It's not, he didn't, he didn't say, he didn't say, well, you know what, here's my examples for how faith without works is dead. You know the Pharisees? And they go to synagogue like a couple times a month. Like even, even they go to synagogue every week. And that's, that's how their, that's their works. That's how their faith is supported because they, they simply walk into a building. He doesn't say, he doesn't say that, they, that their faith is justified because they give up sugar for Lent. He uses Abraham putting the son that he had longed for for years and years and years. Some of you have battled with infertility. You know what it's like to long for a child. Abraham, that's exactly where he was. And the Lord finally came through and he, and he, and he says, now put him on the altar. Abraham says, whatever you say, God. Rahab helped rescue the enemy knowing that not only her life, but the life of her family was in jeopardy. Can you see how, how much risk that is? And yet all throughout scripture, the examples of faith that we see, they produce radical actions. So we, we talked about Abraham and Rahab. What about Daniel and his friends? We just got out of the book of Daniel, right? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They're going into the fiery furnace they're like, God, we don't understand. He's like, I know. God, we don't want to do this. He's like, I know, but I'll be with you in the fire. What about Daniel? He goes into the lion's den for his faith. And he's in the lion's den not knowing what's going to happen. He, he doesn't know that God's going to deliver him. But, but God shows up and he shuts the mouths of the lions. And he goes, I know that was hard, but I'll be with you in the lion's den. What about David? David fought a giant. No one else would. The grown men wouldn't do it, but David did. And he says, I don't know how this is going to work, God, but I know you're, bigger, you're more of a giant than he is. So I'd rather be on your side than on his and he goes to battle, trusting in the Lord. The apostles, over, flip over in the New Testament, and, and you see the story of the apostles. Jesus dies on the cross. And, and before he dies on the cross, he says, you're going to be persecuted just like I am. And people didn't like the message, so they killed the messenger. And now he's like, and now go out and share that same message. And they're like, wait a minute. They didn't like it when you said it. They're not going to like it when we say it. And he's like, I know. And they went out and they spread the gospel. They went to different cities and different states and different countries and different continents. And they shared the very same message that got Jesus killed. And those are just a few a few of the stories in scripture where true faith produces radical actions. <clears throat> true faith produces radical action for the upside down kingdom of God. Now, what does that look like? Well, for some of you, maybe it looks like you being here for however long 
and now God puts it on your heart to go get in your car on Sundays, drive across town and be a part of something new that he's doing on the other side of the city. Maybe there's this, this good looking pastor who's going over there. <laughs> Even my wife's laughing. <laughs> and maybe he's saying, you know what? I know this, I know this isn't easy for you. I know you've been at Calvary for X amount of years. I know that all of your relationships are here. I know there's work to be done. I know this is something new. I know you don't like change. Fill in the blank. Whatever the thing is inside of you that's creating anxiety about what God's calling you to do, to go across town and be a part of something new, to reach people for Christ in a different neighborhood. But God resources what he calls. And the question is not, if God's calling you to do that, it's not, should you do that? It's, do you trust me? God's not calling everybody in this room to go across town. Maybe I just gave you a way out. <laughs> God, for some of you, it just looks like God's saying, it's time to get out of your comfort zone. For so long, your faith has been defined by what building you show up in on a Sunday morning. For so long, your, your faith has been defined by a, a sticker on the back of your window. For so long, your faith has been def defined by that one church sweatshirt that you wear everywhere. I love that you wear them, I love the stickers, I love that you're here. But James is saying, and saving faith produces more than that. So what is God asking you to do? What is, what's he calling you to do that's beyond your, your gifting, that's beyond your, your abilities, that's beyond what you've been experienced in? What's he calling you to do to step out of your comfort zone? Peter had never stepped out of the boat until he did. But saving faith produces radical action for the kingdom of God. God is calling you to do something. Maybe you're serving. We've got a ministry fair. And as you're going around, I want to challenge you to decide which tables were decorated by men and which ones are decorated by women. I think you'll be able to tell. We have a ministry fair. Maybe you've been serving in a ministry and you've been a, a team leader. Maybe you haven't served at all. I'd encourage you, sign up somewhere. Maybe you've been a team leader and God's put it in your heart, and it's time for me to be a coach. Maybe you're a coach and it's like God's saying, you have the, you have the ability to be a director, to take it one, one level up. We got a whole new campus. We got to structure that campus for leadership pipeline. Leadership development. What does it look like for God to do a work in you that stirs you to something new, something that's bigger than you, so that you get the privilege of watching him work in your life? I can't answer that. I don't know what God is putting on your heart. But I do know it's not something little. It's not something easy. but it is eternally significant.